How do we make a clock? How do we multiply a clock signal? That is the topic for today. Clocks and PLLs. And let's dive in. So I, I want to justify a bit why we need clocks. And one of the circuits that is really central to making clocks and multiplying clocks is a face lock loop. It is one of the options to take a low input frequency clock and multiply up to a high frequency. And we'll have a look today how that works. Okay, <clears throat> but first, why? <laughs> I, I really think it is important to understand the why because then it becomes easier to under understand which key parameters matter on a analog circuit. When it comes to clocks, they are used in a multitude of applications. We have them in the digital, we have them in radios, we have them in energy harvesters. We saw last time how we used switch mode converters and there we need a clock to switch between the different switches. We need them in ADCs to get us a, a accurate timing. And it's a really nice way to make accurate delays and we can use them in switch cap filters. So they have a lot of uses, but how do you know which one of these uses is used on a chip? Well, you start by looking at the PCB. And if you know what you're looking for, the PCB can actually tell you quite a bit. So what you're looking at right now is a pretty bad zooming image of the 5340DK from Nordic Semiconductor. And we can see the chip in the middle. That is a uh, Bluetooth MCU with uh, two, actually it's two CPUs inside, one for the radio and one for the application. Uh, it has a 2.4 gigahertz Bluetooth and a 2254 radio. Now around, we can notice there are other components. So often called passives because there are they are passive components. They're not active. They don't have a power. <laughs> One of them is the X1 here. That is a 32 megahertz crystal. That is a piece of, I think it's quartz, that resonates at pretty exactly 32 megahertz, plus minus, let's say, 30, 40 ppm, parts per million. Now that is 32 megahertz, but coming out of the radio, which we can't really see here, but we can see the antenna in number three, sort of in the PCB, that frequency coming out is around 2.4 gigahertz. So somehow inside this piece of silicon, we turn 32 megahertz into 2.4 gigahertz, and we do it pretty exactly. And that's the main topic for today. How do we multiply clocks? There are a couple of others, uh, other clock related things on the PCB here also. We have the X2, which is a 32768 hertz resonator. And that's used for a real time clock because, well, 32768 is two to the power of 15, which means that we can make a binary counter and easily count to a second. and in Bluetooth communication, the transmission and reception of data is actually timed. So we go up, we advertise, and we send, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, on the channels that are 2402 megahertz and 2426 and 2480. But once we establish a connection and we want to transmit data between us, we agree on points in time pretty exactly where we are to transmit and receive. And between those connection intervals, as, 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 as it's called, it could be maybe 100 milliseconds between those connection intervals where we are transmitting data, well, then the whole system goes to sleep. And the only thing that we try to keep alive is the low frequency oscillator and consume in the system as little as possible. 
Now, in order to do this power efficiently, we also have to employ switch mode regulators. And that's what we can see on the PCB on top here. We have the L1, we have L2, and we have L3. So here we actually have three DC-DCs in order to make the most efficient use of the electrons that come from the battery. Inside a MCU like this, a microcontroller like this, we can make some assumptions what has to be inside based on the external components. So we have a 32 megahertz resonator. That is a passive crystal. That doesn't do anything. It doesn't, it only has two pins. <laughs> We actually have to have a circuit inside the integrated circuit that gives energy to this resonator and makes it sort of oscillate back and forth. That is what we have in the crystal oscillator. And the crystal oscillator will give the energy to the crystal and actually keep the amplitude on the crystal at a certain level such that we can extract a very, very pure 32 megahertz signal. Same for the 32 kilohertz crystal. Now, once we have that frequency reference, we have a fixed point in clock, <laughs> a timing reference. Then we can use these phase locked loops in order to multiply the clock. We can either multiply it up to 2.402 or 2.04 or all the different Bluetooth channels, or we can multiply it up to whatever clock frequency we, we are running in the microcontroller, which maybe is 64 megahertz or 128 megahertz, and that just depends on the application. It is also possible to make RC oscillators that are reasonably accurate, because sometimes, well, these crystals, they cost money, and if you don't have to have them, because you don't necessarily need that accurate timing reference for the real-time clock, then you can make do with an internal RC oscillator. We'll go into more details on the crystal oscillators and the RC oscillators next time, but the topic for today is phased locked loops. We also know that inside, well, we have a microcontroller and there's a bunch of digital gates, millions of digital gates. And it's important to realize that <laughs> one of the fundamental assumptions we have made in digital is that we only need to think about ones and zeros. As long as we keep to that assumption or that abstraction, then dig digital becomes possible to synthesize from the RTL. We can automatically place it, we can route it, we can make sure that timing is correct. And when it comes to timing, that's where clocks come in. So what you're looking at now is a typical sort of abstract view of a sea of logic gates. We have our input registers. Actually, let's go full screen for this part. So we have our input registers noted by, well, the input signals to the registers is noted by A0 to AN, and they deliver a output into a logic gate cloud with a Y. On the receiving end, so the other side of the logic gate, we have our B0 to BN, that's sort of the signal coming into the register, and then out from the register again, we have the X0 to XN. Now, all of these registers are clocked on a clock. It is, although it's the same clock, it doesn't actually have to be same time everywhere on your chip. Usually, if the if the logic gates or if the uh, digital logic on the chip is quite large, then there could be what we call an insertion delay. So from the clock strikes on one part of the chip, there might be nanoseconds until it strikes on the other side of the chip. And that's not really the important part. The important part is not the, the absolute real time. It is, are the signals stable? So once they propagate from my YN, or sorry, Y0 to my B0, is the clock, is the, is the input signal to the last register stable? So for example, let's say we clock and we shift the data from A to Y. When we do that, then 
suddenly we start sort of a chain of events, a ripple inside the combinatorial logic in the middle here. This is my always comb in my uh, RTL. At some point in time, the bees will start to change. Before the bees start to change, I have to make sure that I have actually captured the previous value because the clock strikes at roughly the same time for both the input registers and the output registers. So if there's not enough time, if there's not enough delay from my Y's to my B's, then I get errors in my logic. And now maybe my one is not a one, it's maybe a 0 0.5. In the same manner, we have to make sure that the rippling of logic states through the combinatorial logic actually is fast enough such that the state changes at B before the next clock cycle. And all these things, all these paths, delay paths, we have to check for every single possible logic gate and logic or yeah, logic path on the chip. You have to check for every single one of them. And there might be millions upon millions. So it takes quite a bit of effort, actually, to make sure that our assumption abstraction, that is, we only need to deal with ones and zeros, is true. And that's what uh, the open lane flow does. It takes your RTL, it translates it into logic gates, and then it tries to maybe even resize them or redistribute them or make sure that when you have a certain clock rate on your registers there is enough time between launch and capture. This is often called a static timing analysis. But in your static timing analysis it it's a bit tricky if you have to deal with a clock that is too fast because then you don't have enough time anymore. So quite often when we say that the clock is 64 megahertz, then we have to be quite relatively precise. Maybe it's 64 megahertz maximum plus 5% or maximum plus 10%. All this has to be taken into account in our static timing analysis. So accurate clocks is important. Now for digital logic, you can usually run it as a slow rate as you want. So that's easy. But what is this magic circuit that is the phased locked loop? I know quite a few PLL designers. I am not a PLL designer myself. I dabble <laughs> in PLLs. I know the principles. I know enough to be able to in maybe inspire you to learn more. But I'm not an expert. I know experts though. I know multiple experts. And some of them have spent their life on PLLs. It is what they do, it is what they know, it is what they make on every single new chip. And they're really good at it. You can actually make a career out of knowing how to design PLLs because they are actually quite a tricky circuit. But what I'll do today, today is to try to explain the principles behind face lock loops. There are There's more information in the uh, book, the analog book that we have in the course. There is also a pure PLL book from Razavi, which I think, yeah, this one. Oh, let's see. Let's go full screen. This one, Design of CMOS Face Lock Loops. That's a book I would recommend if you want to dive deeper into PLLs. But what is it? <laughs> well, again, we are talking about a circuit that leverages negative feedback. We looked at this uh, when we talked about sigma delta modulators, but the basic principle of the circuit that you're looking at now is take our output, which in this figure is a voltage, feed it back and subtract it from the input, and Vx then is our error signal. Put in a loop filter with a lot of gain, and what we can see here then is that what we can force if our H of S is really large, maybe even infinite, is that the output voltage is exactly the same as the input voltage. 
The same principle applies in PLLs. But to my knowledge, PLLs is the only instance where you actually have infinite in the H of S. It is possible to make the output exactly the same as the input, given enough time. Usually the H of S is we have to limit it because there is limited op amp gain or there's limited gain in our circuits or maybe you have a headroom problems. But phase lock loops are a slightly different. The basic principle is take your output frequency, wherever, whatever it may be, divide it down such that it is the same as your frequency reference. This might be the 32 megahertz reference that we get from the crystal oscillator. From that, we get an error signal, and use it, put that error signal into an H of S and into a oscillator. The H of S in this case is usually low pass filter, and we'll see later the linear model for the oscillator and the, the full loop. But the principle here is exactly the same as negative feedback. Now we are forcing our output frequency divided by a number. Let's say if I wanted to generate 2400 megahertz from a 32 megahertz input reference, then I'd have to multiply by 75. So then this n needs to be 75. But for example, for my Bluetooth channels, well, there's a Bluetooth channel at 2.402, and that doesn't match with 32 megahertz. That's not an integer number. So that means the division factor here to hit 2402 megahertz can't be an integer. Or it's not possible with the engine number there. And I kind of want to hit 2.402, I want to hit 2.404, and all the way up to 2480, maybe even with one megahertz spacing for some radio standards. But my input reference is 32 megahertz, so how do I do it? <laughs> well, one thing I can do is actually divide down at the input. So I can take my frequency reference, I can divide by a number, for example, 32 megahertz, and now I have a one megahertz reference, and then I can choose a number here that is 2400, and 2402, and 2404, and such my division factor is simply a counter. I'm counting the output cycles of my oscillator, I'm comparing to a frequency reference, and somehow this is hooked up in a negative feedback loop with a lot of gain. You actually don't have to do this with a what we call a phase lock loop. Is it is possible to do exactly the same thing with what's called a frequency lock loop. In that case, you may measure the number of, for example, if you have a counter here and you measure the number number of cycles on the uh, output frequency as a function of one period of the input frequency, 32 megahertz, then you can actually determine, am I at the right frequency or not? And then you can have a digital controlled oscillator to be able to tune it up and down and sort of make this into a digital system where you are continuously adjusting the frequency, but you're not what we call a phase lock loop. So there are many options. I wanted to show one more because there is a problem by doing division ratios at the input here. There is a rule of thumb for phase lock loops, which says that whatever H of S you put in, that better have a bandwidth that is roughly one tenth of the reference frequency that you're comparing to. The reason for that is if too much of the reference frequency goes through the filter, the low pass filter, then the oscillator will start jumping up and down and, and it becomes not that clean an output and it might not even be stable, the loop. So the challenge with dividing down the input reference as I do here down to one megahertz is that now I have to have an H of S that is quite low frequency. Maybe it's 100 kilohertz bandwidth. In that case, this whole loop is actually quite slow. Maybe it takes 10 microseconds or even much longer if I need uh, accurate settling, maybe it takes 
60 microseconds or 80 microseconds for this loop to settle. And in Bluetooth communication, for example, there is only 150 microseconds between you transmit and I receive, and I'm supposed to transmit and you receive, which means that my PLL has to be able to change frequencies relatively fast. So in those type of systems, what you'll usually find is a slightly different way of hitting the right target frequency given a certain um, frequency reference at the input. So what you're looking at now is something called a sigma delta PLL or fractional sigma delta, uh, as fractional PLL. So what we're doing is we're taking our 32 megahertz uh, input signal and we're putting it through the filter through an oscillator again and we get our, for example, 2.402 megahertz output signal. We divide it, divide, it by, by, divide it by some factor, which may not be our 75 factor, it might be less. Maybe it's two or four or eight or something to get the frequency down into something comfortable, maybe a few hundred megahertz. Then we can apply a sigma delta modulator, similar to as we discussed a few lectures ago, and feed that back to our comparison with our frequency reference. And we can use the sigma delta modulator divider. Now, maybe it's a bit hard to envision what that means, but think of it like this. Let's say I wanna divide by 75 for this whole chain. What I could do if I wanted to, <laughs> actually, I wanted to buy, divide by 75.2. What I could do then is divide by 76 for a while, and then dis d divide by 75 for a bit longer time. Now, on average, I could tune it in such that the average frequency or the average division ratio is actually 75.2. But then you start jumping between two division ratios. Of course, that creates noise when you inject it into your comparison with the frequency reference, but if you use a sigma delta modulator to control this sort of, these uh, stepping, then you can, can control where that noise ends up. And as long as you place that noise above the loop bandwidth of the H of S, then it disappears. That's the rough principle. There are details. One of the key things in a PLL is it is used in radios. Now you should, well, maybe you recognize the equation that you're looking at right now. It's sort of the general equation for radio communication. We have a cosine of two pi and the frequency of some sort of carrier. I see. <laughs> I see now I have forgotten the, the T in here. There should have been a T. You know what? Uh, let me pause for a minute. Now the equation I think is correct. I was missing the T. Anyway, at a certain frequency, we have a carrier. This is our 2.4 gigahertz carrier. This is the constant part of the output frequency. When we want to transmit some sort of data, it might be digital, it might be analog. What we can do is we can add modulation. We can either add that modulation in the amplitude, just by modulating the strength of the carrier, the power that we transmit in the carrier, or we can modulate the phase by adding a varying phase to this uh, carrier frequency. That's our AM modulated signal or our PM modulated signal. And then there is frequency modulation, which basically is a form of phase modulation. In Bluetooth, we are actually not using the, well, in Bluetooth low energy, we're not using the AM modulation part. That is just a constant one. And all we're doing is changing the phase in a certain pattern. Actually, what we're doing is we're changing the frequency for a certain duration to change the phase, and then we change the frequency for a certain duration the other direction to change the phase back again. And by doing this, we can 
send our binary data over the air to record your heart rate on your phone. But how do we actually implement it in the circuit? What we could do is simply to add our frequency modulation directly to our reference somehow. We could change our reference frequency. So if we had our 32 megahertz reference, maybe we could modify that frequency directly on the crystal by changing the capacitor size. That might not be enough, <laughs> but something, some principle similar to that, and just allow the PLL to settle. And as long as the PLL is fast enough, then we can modulate that way because the output frequency will track the input frequency or the reference frequency pretty exactly. But as I talked about before, there is a finite time requires, required to settle in the PLL because of the bandwidth of the HFS. So the faster frequency you have in, the faster it could settle and this type of scheme becomes easier. However, most radios today will have something called a two-point modulation. So most radios that are used in radio communication will have a fractional PLL with a sigma delta modulator and you add the modulation signal both on the oscillator directly and then you add the opposite on somewhere in the divider path. Now, if you do it correctly, and the scaling factors here are not correct, but if you do it correctly, then the modulation signal actually becomes invisible to the loop. The loop, the, the feedback loop does not see the modulation signal at all because you're adding it at the oscillator and you're subtracting it in the feedback path. So this is what's called two-point modulation and it's pretty much implemented in most type of radios. If you look in IEEE Explorer, you'll find many, many examples on this type of PLLs. Okay, I think we need an example. <laughs> I need to demonstrate a bit more detail around face lock loops. I have made one. It's a pretty bad one, <laughs> but it's in um, it's in um, Skywater. I'll put the link in the description below, and it's going to be in the lecture notes. But let's go into the schematic and have a look at that face lock loop. Okay, I need to go to ASEX, and uh, I have to remember to make uh, my terminal a lot bigger so you can see what's going on. Okay, that should be big enough. IP, let's see. I need um, my Sun PLL, and I'm going to go into work, and I want to start XCAM. Design Sun PLL. And it's called Sun PLL Schematic. And let's see. I wonder, let's go full screen. And let's try with a white background. Let me just toggle the color scheme like that. Okay. So. Let's look at the different pieces here. First of all, a high flying view. What I'm circling right now is the oscillator. So if I zoom into that, this is our oscillator. If I go inside, you will see that that is a, what's called a ring oscillator. This is inverters. We have eight inverters that are hooked up. It's a, it's a maybe a bit hard to read, but this sort of sort of a, <laughs> Um, a fancy way of connecting things in series. I have my eight instances, zero to seven, of my, oh, that was a bit too close, <laughs> of my inverters. And then to the output, I connect a bus that goes from seven to zero. And at the input, I connect a NI, which is, it's just an input, and then seven to one, which means that these become uh, series connected, the inverters. The NI is controlled by a, well, this is a NAND gate, and that's done in order to ensure that the ring oscillator 
starts up in a known state. There are nine inversions. Actually, if I had made this ring oscillator again, I actually would have chosen a prime number. And the reason for that is I have seen instances of multiple waves of... So it's kind of like a wave traveling through the ring oscillator. I've seen instances of multiple wave travel through um, ring oscillators that are large. But that can only happen if you have a non-prime number a ring oscillator, I believe. I haven't proven that, but uh, I was... Um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> it should probably have been, let's see, 11's a prime number, right? I think so. Now, in order to control the frequency of the ring oscillator, I'm actually changing the VDD of the ring oscillator. So there's a VDD ROSC here. Now, I can't feed the output signal of the ring oscillator directly into the clock output because my voltage at VDD ROSC is now low. I have to have a level shifter in order to get up to the VDD. So that's what I have in this block. And let's go inside that one. If you haven't seen the level shifter before, this circuit is pretty much how most level shifters work. You have two NMOSs pulling down, sort of with inverse input, and then there's kind of like a latch in the top section here. When the AN is active, it will pull Y down, and at some point that will turn on the PMOS on the left side, and pull the YN up, and vice versa. And when you design level shifters, it's really, really important that the NMOSs are quite a bit stronger than the PMOSs, which they usually are, but here it depends on voltage, blah, blah, blah. And then we just have a couple of buffers at the output. So that's our oscillator. Now, in order to divide down that oscillator, so we can compare to our reference, I am using what's called a ripple counter. Here you can actually use a real counter, but right now I'm just using divide by two stages. So I'm taking my clock output. I am feeding that to a D flip-flop. The negative output of the flip-flop feeds back to the, pos uh, to the D input, which means that the D5 here becomes half frequency of the CK input. These type of dividers are actually dividers that can go wrong. Because if there's not enough delay from N6 back to, or from the QN back to the D, you can actually get a case where these dividers don't work. So it's really, really important that you make sure that the overall corners, the dividers still work. And to be honest, analog simulation is probably not enough either. Probably should have done um, static timing analysis here. Anyway, this is the demo, so. And then there's a bunch of stages. So there's, uh, let's see, there's um, one, two, three, four, five divided divider stages. Two to the power of five is 32. So this is a one divided by 32 divider. So the feedback clock that's coming back here, that will be 132 of our output frequency. Now, in order to compare, sorry, in order to compare our divider back, divider back clock with our, our frequency reference, we need something called a phase and frequency detector. There are many versions of a phase and frequency detector. This is one. The, it's using two flip flops. These are a slightly different flip flip flop than than the other ones. This is a true single phase clock type of flip-flop. It's not easy to see from the schematic how it works, but, well, I guess, trust me, it works. It's kind of like a, yeah, maybe this is a latch, actually. Is it a flip-flop or a latch? I don't remember. Anyway, this structure you'll find in books. I would uh, encourage you to maybe once, all Later, we may, might have a look at how the different signals work when it comes out here. What, you, what I want you to notice right now is that somehow the reference clock and the feedback clock is compared. And what I get out is two signals. 
one that says you should pull the frequency down and one that says you should pull the frequency up to the feedback loop. And that is what happens in the next block, which we call a charge pump. So here we have this up inverted and CP down. And what you can see note, and notice here is that we have a couple of NMOSs. They have a voltage at the gate, which comes from a bias source. So in the, in the drain or drain source current of these NMOSs will actually be a known current. I, I don't remember how much it was. Maybe it was 100 nanoamps or something like that in the circuit. And then we mirror that in a PMOS and then down to a switch. And what happens now is that if the face detector says the frequency should go, frequency should go up, then it injects a current into the LPF output here. We'll later see where that goes. But right now, imagine there's a capacitor there. It puts that current into that capacitor for a certain amount of time. And if the charge bond down signal is active, then it pulls some current from that capacitor for a certain amount of time. The loop filter, which is our low pass filter, that is a set of capacitors. So VLPF here, and let me zoom in. VLPF that, oh, sorry. <laughs> that feeds to capacitors. Here we go. And there's not that many capacitors, but then we have a really big capacitor, capacitor here that is connected to the same node, but through a couple of resistors. These are poly resistors. And that becomes what we call our uh, control voltage. But we can't really pull current from this control voltage, this, this VLPF, which means I have put in a unity gain buffer, which is a op amp in a unity gain feedback with some load caps that actually drives the inverter. This is actually very, very similar to a low dropout regulator. It's just that the, uh, the output is the same as the input, but that's pretty much the same thing. So that feeds our VDD ROSC. Okay, so that's, that's our PLL. Now, I'm going to make an incredibly important point. So listen closely. All face locked loops must be calculated. There is no room for cowboy design in PLLs. If you're going to make a PLL or face locked loops stable, you have to look at the transfer functions and the different uh, gains. I, I promise you that everyone <laughs> that has worked on PLLs will tell you this. And it's written in every book. So just take to heart, you cannot design PLLs by just trying things. You actually have to calculate. Now, what is it you have to calculate? Well, a PLL is actually a nonlinear circuit. I mean, we have clocks in there, we have filters, we have charge pumps going up and down, we have an oscillator. So how can we linear, linearize it in order to look at the transfer function? Well, when the PLL loop is actually settled and, and sort of locked, locked by locked we mean that it's sort of stable, it's uh, continuously adjusting the phase, the phase of the output signal is the same as the reference signal. At that point, it becomes actually a linear loop as long as we have this sort of uh, the loop bandwidth of the filter, the HFS, is much less than the reference signal. But it's not linear in voltage or frequency, it is linear in phase. So that's maybe a bit of a mental change for all of you. So what I've done now is redrawn exactly the same PL as we had before, but now it is showing the phase signal. So we have some sort of phase in, we have a phase difference coming out. 
there is a certain gain in the phase detector, there is a gain in the loop filter, and a certain loop filter transfer function. And then there's an oscillator, and we have our output phase. And then there's a divider, and we get our divider by down phase, which is compared to our input phase. So here we can use the standard sort of loop uh, gain functions, and we can drive a equation for the loop gain. And what I want you to notice is that there is a 1 over s in this loop transfer function, or loop, yeah, loop transfer function, loop gain function. A 1 over s is an integrator. An oscillator turns out to be a perfect integrator of phase, which means we can actually make the phase of the output signal exactly the same as the phase of the input signal, on average, given enough time. And that's just insanely cool. I, I, I'm not sure you... I hope you realize how cool that is. A PLL is somewhere where you have infinite gain in the control in the feedback loop given a rubidium crystal which is a sort of the atomic clocks which is based on the hyperfine splitting of energy levels in rubidium is it 85 or 87 i don't remember it's sort of a, a ultra precise atomic clock given that type of reference i can make any frequency with a pll and it will have almost the same accuracy. There'll be some noise, but on average, I can have, get exactly the same accuracy as my input, kind of. And that's just cool. I think it's cool, at least. Maybe this is not the most exciting thing you heard today, but I think it's really cool. But as I said, all PLLs need calculations. So what you actually have to figure out for every single one of the blocks is the parameters that go into this loop filter, or loop gain equation. One of the first ones is what we call the K, the oscillator gain, which is basically 2 pi times the change in frequency as a function of the change in the control voltage. So that's actually something you have to simulate, that's something you have to measure on, or simulate on, <laughs> in SPICE on your oscillator. And usually, for actually for this VDD-based oscillator, which is actually a really bad idea, don't do this in a real circuit. The KVCO is a bit large because a change in VDD actually causes a huge change in frequency, which is, gives us a large K uh, oscillator gain. And you, we can see that here. So what I've plotted here is the frequency of the oscillator, the ring oscillator, at different VDDs. And the different lines here are the different transistor corners. So we can recognize we have slow corner, we have high temperature, typical corner, low temperature, and so on. Now the slope, that will be our KVCO, our oscillator gain. Or yeah, oscillator gain. And we can see that the KVCO, the slope of these uh, lines, that also changes from technology or from corner to corner. Now what's important, really, really important, is that over all corners, we are able to hit the oscillator frequency that we want to hit. Because what the PLL will do is sort of travel along the lines, control the voltage, the VDDR OSC, in order to hit the right oscillator frequency. Now if the oscillator cannot hit that frequency, then the phase lock loop doesn't work, of course. So. A lot of the PLL design is in the oscillator. There's also quite a lot of design in the charge pump. Principle of the charge pump, which is sort of this pulling up, pulling down a certain amount of charge, is maybe simple. There's a certain, the gain in that charge pump, or actually in the phase detector also, is just given by the current in the charge pump divided by 2 pi, because a certain energy that is placed into the system every cycle. Now, there is some design concerns in charge pumps also, but first order, you can go and read in Rezavi's book in order to find those details. Now, the loop filter. I am not going to go in detail into the loop filter design. I will encourage you to read the book to actually understand. And there are strategies also for choosing different loop filters, I believe, in the book. 
but usually it's as we saw a combination of capacitors and capacitors and resistors and that's what I have listed here that's the um, transfer function for that particular loop filter and we can see our R's and we can see our C1 and our C2 now <clears throat> divider that's simply a divider so the gain of the divider is just a divide by n <coughs> sorry so what we have to do now is figure out whether our loop is stable and in order to do that you have to know these gain factors so the oscillator gain the phase detector gain the loop filter gain and the loop filter transfer function we need to know the divider factor and well the s is just the oscillator that's fine so what i've done is go to python and let's see if i have the right one up here no it's this one okay this might be small let's make it bigger oh that's maybe too big let's remove that remove that make it slightly smaller yeah okay plot function we can skip okay so what i've done here is this is just a frequency i'm creating a logarithmic space uh yeah we don't need the numpy uh, i'm creating my s which is just j omega i have extracted from from simulation my oscillator gain so that's uh, i guess this is 1.6 gigahertz per volt and then i have my current oh okay so it was it was one micro <laughs> the current and then i've inserted the values of my resistors and the capacitors that i have in the design and my dividers divider ratio and then calculate the transfer function i guess that comes uh, here here's my loop function and then somehow i don't remember how i do this but somehow i plot <laughs> the uh, loop gain loop gain and also the closed loop uh, function and what we can see when we do that is well that's slow anyway yeah so <clears throat> loop gain we can see that for low frequencies the loop gain proceeds towards infinite because we have this one over s function here we have 100 db gain that's an, uh, quite a lot now what we're looking at here is the um, sort of closed loop transfer function and that we can see we get a gain of one for most of the frequencies and then it rolls off and here we can also plot the phase margin of the PLL and I encourage again read in the book I have here selected a few values for the resistors and the capacitors in order to get a phase margin that makes sense and I can't stress this enough you have to actually calculate before you try and uh, put in the values and just simulate before we leave our Jupyter notebooks actually you can find these in the links uh, in the notes let's also see if we're able to see how the face detector works <clears throat> hopefully no unfortunately not maybe not I did not simulate that okay well that's disappointing or maybe it works anyway okay let's try and run everything so what I wanted to show was the the up and down signals and the feedback clock and our reference clock so let's see i'm plotting early in the settling here now so this is actually just that startup so we can see our reference clock i think in this case i'm actually using eight megahertz reference clock so the output frequency of the um, the pll should be 32 times that so that should be i guess 256 megahertz and here we can see the feedback clock so we can immediately see that the feedback clock is actually slightly faster 
Uh, let's do 2.8, maybe 1. Did I simulate that long? Let's see. Yeah. Okay. So here we can see that the feedback clock is faster. Now, initially, it'll get a bit confused, but after a while, this is the sort of inverted signal, so c CK up N. Uh, when it's high, means that we're not supposed to pull up, so the PMOS will be off. And we can see that the CK down, that is on. So right now, we can immediately see the CK feedback is too high, the frequency of that uh, feedback clock is too high compared to our reference, and the up signal is mostly off, while the down signal is mostly on. And then, well, know that this Jupyter Notebook is also in the PLL IP, and if you simulate the schematics, you will actually be able to see the rest of the settling, or rest of the <laughs> signals. But that's how the charge pump works. It sort of compares the two signals and then puts the, sig and the up and down signal up correctly. <laughs> Anyway, it's getting late in the day here in uh, Norway. So, important, important, important. If you want to make a PLL, you have to learn to be comfortable with the new transfer function and actually calculating the phase margin and making sure it's stable. And if you do, then you can get a PLL that works. So right now, what you're looking at is a simulation of the PLL I just showed you is a layout simulation. I, uh, in this case, we are, I'm kicking a bit on the um, VDD ROSC, so it's starting out quite high in order to make sure that the oscillator has started. And as the loop starts to settle, initially we can see that the uh, it's sort of continuously settling down, and at some point the clock frequency actually goes too low it should be 256, mega, 256 megahertz, and then it starts to settle in, and we can see that it stabilizes on pretty much exactly 256 megahertz. If I had continued this and averaged it more, then you would see it's exactly 256 megahertz. So PLLs, a very cool circuit. In the IP, I've also got the layout. You can see here that one of the big components in a analog PLL will be this loop filter, these capacitors and resistors. So on the left side here is just the uh, namings and placings of the different blocks. So we have the charge pump down left, we have the phase detector, we have this kick circuit that just starts up, make sure that the VDD ROSC is high, and then we have the uh, buffer, the op amp, we have the oscillator, ring oscillator, and if you if you wanted to try to make something yourself and make it better, the ring oscillator is the first thing that I would encourage you to fix, because the KVC of the ring oscillator is way too large. We need, it should be made much more stable for 256 megahertz if that's the frequency target than it is right now. And then we have the divider. So yep, you can see the exposed circuits on the on the right side and really the big part of any analog PLL will be the loop filter, these low pass filter. These days it's actually quite a few PLLs that have transitions the loop filter into digital and they do something called digital PLLs and they use digital controlled oscillators and something called a time to digital converter in order to transfer from the output frequency over into a digital domain and then do a digital loop filter. Very interesting concept. Okay, I'll put the link to the repository in the, uh, <laughs> in the what's the call, comments below, <laughs> brain starting to not work anymore. Anyway, thanks for listening today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you'll find it useful. I hope it inspired you to look more into PLLs. It is a really cool circuit. Thanks. And subscribe, like, and all that stuff. And if you have any questions, just post them in the comments below. Have a fantastic day.